Welcome to almost the end of CS50. This is week 11, and week 12, as you know, is the end game. So last lecture, uh, this coming Monday, quiz one is this coming Wednesday, so a few announcements about that. So quiz, same places as last time. See the handout that's on the website if you haven't already. I'll be holding those last minute, late night panic office hours Tuesday night in Maxwell Dorkin's cafe on the ground floor at 8 p.m. till whenever. If you have questions that you would like to address at that point in time, and the TFs and CAs have some as well well this week. Uh, coming up is PSET 5's deadline. So this little guy has um, yet to have anyone submit photographs of him. And my god, I walked all over campus for like two hours with that friend taking these photographs. And I know some of you guys have found some of these photos because Ken and I and Alex and Jansu have all been photographed, but no one's actually submitted their little map of photos. So you have till Friday at midnight of this week for that amazing prize. Uh, coming up next Monday. So also, this week we have this little blurb. Uh, the Harvard Extension School has put together this program here. Very fancy invitation here. Uh, there is a panel discussion with a number of alumni and fairly famous people led by our own Harry Lewis, a professor in the computer science department. Uh, it's entitled No More Teachers, No More Books, Higher Ed in the Networked Age. This is this Wednesday at 4 o'clock if this interests you. And then they've also invited some of us, 10 or fewer, uh, to the faculty club afterwards. So we thought we'd turn this into a faculty club reception with David and team. If you would like to join us, um, go ahead and go to cs50.net slash rsvp. Among other things, you'll have chances to chat with faculty, myself, some of the TFs and CAs, also Craig Silverstein, who was Google employee number one, uh, and who's actually on this panel that Harry is moderating. So take a peek at that if you're interested. This I thought was kind of timely. So I was literally writing the tea this morning, and the uh, Metro, this free paper in Boston, had this ad here, or this, uh, adver uh, this uh, article. New best friend for MBTA bus riders. And it goes on to discuss an API that the MBTA has just released in hopes, frankly, that other people will now implement the rest of this tool for them. Um, so they have opened up, a la Shuttleboy, an API via which you can find out the next times of buses actually arriving in real time. So not printed schedules, but actual real time data for a number of the routes. So frankly, even if you submitted your proposal already, do feel free to bite off something that's perhaps a little different if that appeals. Also, uh, today, at 3 p.m., so half an hour after lecture, Apple Computer itself is going to be offering a uh, seminar on iPhone development. So whether you're tackling an iPhone app project or even are just curious, uh, or like pizza, come by at 3 p.m., Maxwell Dworkin 119. That's one floor up on the Computer Science Building. And what else? We got anything else here? OK. So I'm told UC elections are in progress. And uh, I'm a bit of a pack rat when it comes to maintaining uh, archives of things. So look at what I found. So <laughs> I'd like perhaps to take a chance to redeclare my candidacy some 10 years later. This is perhaps an example of how not to do web design. Or uh, this is what happens when you try to design a website around an animated GIF that you just really want to use for some purpose. Uh, if you actually click through this, you'll see my very verbose platform that I had at the time, uh, including a letter to freshmen, uh, some campaign posts. Posters. And uh, just to give you a little retrospective from 10 years ago, the Undergraduate Council, so this is 1996 or 1997, the Undergraduate Council today suffers from two problems. Not only does the council lack the attention of the student body, it lacks its respect as well. As recent voting turnout suggests, most students neither know who their representatives are nor do they care. Lowell House, our favorite house, given the number of you in this class, uh, for instance, is home to some 450 students, yet only 25 of them voted in 1997. So I do hope that things have come a long way since then. Um, this platform didn't take me very far, clearly. Uh, but good luck to those uh, uh, in this year's elections, which I gather are now in progress. So please, uh, if nothing else, no animated GIFs in your own projects. Finally, uh, I've been told to wear this today. Our own, our own Yuki Yamashita has been designing our CS50 store at store.cs50.net. And I'm told, uh, those of you who celebrate, they make wonderful Christmas gifts. So uh, keep that in mind, perhaps. But today is ultimately about life after 50. Uh, this handout that you have here is an excerpt from the course catalog and all of the courses that you are qualified uh, to take after CS50. Some of them this spring, some of them next fall, and one or two of them only being offered the spring thereafter. 
thereafter. So today realize it's not just about advertising some courses that we think you might want to take, but it's also meant to be a little more academic than that and to give you guys a sense of what more there is in computer science. So many of you statistically will consider CS50 to be a terminal course. You got out of it what you want, and that's sort of enough for you. But realize that there's a lot of holes that you can begin to fill in. Realize that this course surveys a lot of fields, a lot of subfields that you can really only begin to appreciate and master by taking full-fledged courses in these fields. So what we have today is a uh, team of computer science faculty who will be giving you a taste, yes, of these five courses that you might take this spring or coming fall, but also a taste of computer science itself. So realize that there's so much more out there. You've only begun to scratch the surface, and it really takes a good amount of time uh, and attention to really feel like you you've pwned this stuff. So uh, with that said, allow me to introduce Professor Greg Morissette, who teaches Computer Science 51, which is historically, sure, OK, which is historically the uh, follow-up <laughs> to Computer Science 50. And this is the course that I myself took as a second course in computer science. So it's a little close to my heart as well. Professor Thank you, Morissette. David. Good morning. Oh, afternoon, sorry. Uh, what is CS51? CS50 is entitled something like programming. What's it called? What's the official name? Programming 1 or something. Introduction to Computer Science 1. 51 has the wonderful title of Introduction to Computer Science 2. So what's the 2 all about? Well, I hope most of you realize at this point that programming is not that hard. I teach uh, fifth graders sometimes how to program. Scratch is kind of fun for doing that. What I have learned is that you can teach just about anybody how to program. But um, it's very, very hard to program well. And that's what uh, 51 is all about. It's not just programming. Now it's taking it to the next level and seeing how you can program well. And by, what do I mean by well? You need to be able to write code that's reliable, efficient, that it obeys the contracts that it has with the outside world in terms of correctness, in terms of uh, efficiency. It should be testable. The ideal code you should be able to prove correct. It should be easy to maintain. It should be beautiful, something you want to take home and show to your mom. All right, really good code is elegant. And that's what 51 is about. The other part of 51 is that it's supposed to expand your problem solving skills by making it possible to quickly and easily recognize the right tool for the job. So uh, the right tool might be uh, a data structure or algorithm. It may be a conceptual way to think or frame the problem or to break it up into more easily solved subproblems. It may even be a programming language. And the prime directive of CS51 is at all costs to be as lazy as possible. All right, a really good programmer is so lazy they will go out of their way to write code to make it possible to not write code in the future. All right, so they pull out the right things into libraries, into reusable data structures and algorithms. They keep interfaces small and simple, and they reuse somebody else's code whenever they can. But uh, one other thing that they do, and the thing that I'm going to highlight just today, is they pick the right programming tool for the job. So they may pick the right programming language for the job. And to give you an idea of this, I want you to think just for a second as if the Arabs had never invented the numeric notation that we use today. And instead, we were still stuck with Roman numerals. Imagine trying to write an algorithm just to multiply two Roman numerals. It's actually very hard to do. Uh, about the only way I know how to do it that's even reasonable is to translate them first into Arabic numerals, some form of radix uh, 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 numbers, and then do the algorithm at that level, and then convert them back. So the, the way, the language that you have for conceptualizing your problem can have a strong influence on whether you can find a solution and how efficient or how elegant the solution is. So in, uh, now it's true that oftentimes we don't have the luxury of p picking the uh, language or the tools that we're using for a particular programming task. But if you can think in a, in a different language at the right level of abstraction about a problem, and if you understand how those mechanisms are realized, how they're implemented, then you can take those ideas and translate them back into the programming environment that you're forced to use. All right, and that happens day to day in real programming tasks is not thinking necessarily at the level of C code, but thinking at a much higher level of abstraction, and then being able to decompose the problem and translate it back down. So here's a simple example. 
this is one of the data structures that we'll look at. It's the red black tree. It's a data structure that goes back to uh, Sedgwick and uh, Michael's laughing. Do you, do you cover this in 124? Nope. That's why we do it in 51. So uh, it's a balanced binary tree. There are many flavors of these, like B trees, 2, 3 trees, AVL trees. Very useful for representing sets or finite maps or tables. When you need to have efficient support for lookup, insertion, deletion, and so forth. Um, the key thing about red-black trees is that in order to maintain good asymptotic bounds for lookup or insertion, you have to keep the tree balanced. And these two invariants up here, these two properties, are properties that ensure that your tree is always bushy enough that you can guarantee logarithmic access time for insertion or deletion. So these two invariants say that every node, red node has a red child. Uh, no red node has a red child. And every path from the root has the same number of black nodes. So it's just a way of laying out the tree in a balanced fashion so that no chain is too deep. And if you insert a new node and end up breaking these invariants, so here we have uh, this new number, 25, inserted into the tree, and we've broken that invariant, then you have to reorganize the tree on the fly to restore the invariants. Okay? Now, the algorithms for doing this, if you formulate them in, in one language, they can be very tricky to get right. And if you formulate them in another, they can actually be quite simple. So here is the code for doing insertion and rebalancing in a high-level language called ML. It's a functional programming language. And it's one of the languages that we'll be looking at. It provides certain features, such as pattern matching on algebraic data types that makes writing this code a, uh, essentially a one pager or a one slide. If you look at a, your favorite algorithms textbook, for example, Sedgwick has an algorithms textbook, and you look at the code for doing this in C, it's four times the size of that code up there. Here's the code for doing insertion, except I ran out of room and actually have to double the amount of code down here and repeat it except swap red and black. And also, I didn't show you the subroutines, tree insert, left rotate, and right rotate. This is what left rotate looks like. Uh, and right rotate is just like it, except you sort of flip things around and make uh, uh, so, so the point is that actually staring at this code and deciding whether you got it right and whether you're respecting those two properties can be very hard to do. And if you test the code, you may find out that in your particular test cases, it seems to pass all the tests. But if, you, if you've got a really tricky problem, you'd like to have more than just testing as your form of assurance. You might like to go back and formally prove that your code respects these properties that I mentioned. Proving that the, your algorithm is correct is pretty easy on one page of code. It's certainly a lot easier than doing it on four pages of low-level code. This code also has other advantages. It's safe with respect to exceptions and multi-threading, whereas the C code is not. All right? And how do you get those properties? Part of that is because the language is forcing you into a certain discipline that gives you those properties for free. On the other hand, this code is doing functional updates to a data structure, whereas the C code is doing imperative updates. And how do you efficiently translate a high-level language like this down into something like C code? That's something that we're going to be looking at in 51. And the, the goal in this class is to give you an understanding not just of one programming language, but of a bunch of linguistic abstractions that you're going to run into over and over again, although usually they'll have different names. Like Microsoft will give it some name, and Google will give it a different name. And you want to be able to recognize these abstractions and apply them wherever you are. You may be operating in an OO language, and you need the concept of a closure. How can you represent closures as objects? How can you represent objects as closures? These are some of the ideas that we'll be talking about and some of the linguistic mechanisms, like laziness, that we'll be using in the class. We're also going to be seeing some exposure to software engineering techniques. I call these software engineering in the small. So instead of training you how to code 50 million lines of code, uh, which is basically something nobody knows how to do well, witness Microsoft, uh, we're going to be talking about at least little things that you can do to make your code more readable, more testable, more maintainable. Um, so simple things like modular design and how do you use language mechanisms to get modularity. How do, you, how do you do integration and unit tests? And how do you read somebody's code in a critical way? How do you do code reviews? We're also going to be looking at abstract models of computation beyond simple programming languages. So we'll be looking at, for example, space, models for space and time, 
and this is a good uh, prelude into 124, which Michael will tell you about. And we'll be talking about models for reasoning about code at a high level of abstraction, like a substitution model of evaluation. Uh, we'll also be talking about how to prove properties of code, like how do you prove the correctness, or how do you prove the asymptotic efficiency of your code, in a very rigorous and formal mathematical way. Okay, so that's really all I have to say about 51. I'll be around uh, the whole time, though, in case you have any questions. Let me now hand uh, the mic over to Matt Welsh, who's another professor in computer science, and he'll be telling you about CS61. If there are any questions while he's coming up here, I'll be happy to yield. No? Good. Thanks. How do I pull this up? I'm assuming there's a... Uh... Hi, everybody. I'm going to do the rest of this in Latin because we are standing with these esteemed gentlemen on the left and on the right. Um, uh, so I, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about CS61. CS61 and CS51 are like uh, two sides of the same coin. They're both intended to be classes that are taken uh, right after taking CS50. Um, in fact, a lot of freshmen are also taking CS61 this semester. And um, CS61 is an introduction to computer systems and how computers work internally. Um, uh, so the basics of the class we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, at 2.30. Um, the prerequisite is this class or just any C programming experience. Um, you can, in fact, use CS61 for the co CS concentration breadth requirement, that is to satisfy the need to have several classes with different middle digits. Um, you can also use it for the CS secondary. And um, we generally say that most students who have an interest in CS, whether you're going to be a concentrator or just do the secondary, should take both CS51 and CS61 because they, they really complement each other nicely. So what's CS61 all about? Really, this class is about understanding the guts of how computers work, uh, getting under the hood and really driving down on the things that matter uh, to you as a programmer in terms of the performance of the code that you write. So, um, uh, what we try to do is understand how a processor works internally, and then how do you write good C code that can map well onto what the processor knows how to do. This is extremely important in real world, because in the real world, you're going to be expected to be write programs that perform well, and that are, of course, also correct. Um, we'll talk a lot about caching and memory management, that is, how to lay out the data structures in your program so that they get the best performance on the processor and the memory architecture of the machine that you're using. Um, we'll talk a lot about uh, concurrency. So every, every computer that you can buy today basically has multiple processors, multiple cores on the same processor chip. And in order to make use of those, you generally need to write programs that can do multiple things simultaneously. Threading and processes are two uh, straightforward ways of accomplishing that. But writing this kind of code is very complicated because the threads have to interact with each other. So this is one of these things that you need to understand how to do. And, you know, just generally how to write rock solid and fast systems code. So CS61 is extremely practical if you want to improve your programming skills. Um, the reason that I introduced the class was because we saw that there's a huge gap between many of the concepts presented in computer science classes and the reality of how real systems work. And so as you learn how to program in higher level languages like Java or ML, that you do need to have an understanding of how those map down onto what's happening at the physical electronics inside the computer. That's really critical for performance. So you need to understand operating systems. You need to know these details to understand things like operating systems, databases, compilers, and so forth. Um, let me tell you a story that I think motivates the need for a class like CS61. And I think, how many of you have heard of um, this case of Ken Thompson, who is one of the co-inventors of Unix and C, hacking the original Unix system? Has anybody heard this story before? This is, this is a fascinating lesson in uh, why not to trust uh, the code that you're running. Okay, so Ken Thompson, he co-invented the Unix operating system. Uh, he won the Turing Award, which is the uh, computer science community's equivalent of the Nobel Prize. The Turing Award is awarded once a year to an eminent computer scientist, and it's a really, really big deal to win the Turing Award. Um, but, and, and as part of winning the Turing Award, uh, the, the, uh, the winner is asked to give a lecture on their work. And during his Turing Award lecture, Thompson made this admission. He basically reminded people, back in the early days of the Unix system, he wanted to be able to log in to any Unix computer that was installed without having to have a, an account. So what he did was he hacked the login program and added a backdoor. Yeah, so he added a special password that only he knew that if you tried to log in with a password, then it would let him in. Yeah, 
okay? And um, uh, that was really great for debugging, yes? He wasn't trying to do anything malicious with it, but he wanted to understand what was going on inside. The problem was that everybody had the source code. Back in those days, everything was open source, so if somebody happened to look at the code for login, they would notice that there's this back door in the code, and he didn't, he, would, he didn't want people to know about this. He wanted to cover his tracks, right? So what he did was he hacked the C compiler, and the C compiler then understood when it was compiling login.c to add the code for the back door to it before compiling. Does everybody see what's going on here? Yeah? So if you looked at login.c itself, you would not see the back door code. Right. All right. So um, what's the problem? Did this, this works, right? So if you look at for login.c, you won't see the back door. But there's somewhere else you could look that you'd notice where the back door is. Where is it? in the C compiler code itself. Remember, the source code for everything, including the C compiler, was just sitting right there on every Unix system. So you could just look at the source for the C compiler. So here's what he did. He hacked the C compiler to recognize when it was compiling itself to add the code to add the code to login.c for the back door. Yeah? This is a true story. I'm not making this up. And so then he deleted that version of the C compiler. So now we have a C compiler in binary form only that would always, every time it compiled itself, would inject this additional backdoor code into the new version of the C compiler, which would then inject the backdoor code into login. Okay, so um, this is amazing. This is just so cool, right? It's just extremely nefarious. And, the only way that you would have been able to understand that this was happening is if you were able to look at the machine code for either the C compiler or for the login program and notice that there's this back door there, right? It was never present in source code form. So there's no source code that represents the back door anymore. This is an interesting problem. So in CS61, one of the key skills you're going to gain is being able to read machine code and understand what the machine code is doing. Um, so what we're going to do in CS61, learn how machines really work. You're going to really be, be an expert at using things like GDB. We're going to debug the hardest and the most interesting bugs. We're going to drive down to the machine code level in order to do that. Hacking binaries for fun and profit. Um, one of the labs in this class, I'm going to give you a broken uh, uh, binary and you're going to exploit a buffer overrun bug in that binary and cause that binary to do things it was not designed to do. This is basically the gist of how the most viruses and worms propagate. Um, you're going to measure and improve the performance of your programs. We're going to be very focused on getting good performance. And you're going to write multi-threaded multi concurrent programs like a professional. So you're really going to understand how to exploit all those uh, extra cycles and cores on your machines. So this sounds like it's a lot, it's hard, but I, I want to emphasize this is an introductory class. All of you can take CS61 and be successful in it. And so it's challenging, but it's a lot of fun. This is not intended just for hardcore CS concentrators. Um, we'll have five lab assignments. Um, the first one, I give you a binary, and it asks you for a series of seven passwords. You have to get all seven passwords right. I don't give you the source code. So how do you figure out what the passwords are? You have to disassemble the binary, read the machine instructions, and understand what it's trying to, trying to ask you for. OK, this is a lot of fun, and it's quite addictive. Um, you'll do this buffer overrun bug, you'll implement your own version of malloc. I promise after doing this you will understand how pointers work. Um, you'll write your own Unix shell and you're going to build your own concurrent multi-threaded internet service. So uh, there'll be one midterm exam and one final. So that's basically what the whole course is. Um, I'm going to skip over this. You can go look on the website to look at the syllabus. And I just want to leave you with this. So this is my favorite way of representing what CS61 is. How many of you know what this is from? This is from the matrix, yes? So this is how I think of it, which is CS61 is the red pill. Yeah? If you take CS61, you're going to understand what's going on at all these lower levels of what's really happening inside the system. So I encourage you to take CS61, and I will show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Thanks. Uh, well, we'll switch to the movie real quick. Okay. So, so this, uh, this is my former professor, Professor Michael, Mich Michael Mitzenmacher, who teaches Computer Science 124 and okay. has a movie. Sure. So, wait. Um, so, uh, is it going to play? Okay, good. Wait one sec. So, I'm really into algorithms and how they can be used in 
actual reality. So to start with, I thought I'd, before explaining the course, explain some of the research I do by way of a movie to try and give evidence that it's not just that, you know, we come out here and say, yeah, algorithms are important and useful and allow you to do cool things. I'd actually, whoops, like to show you that they allow you to do cool things. So hopefully this will go. In a perfect hash table, we can look up any item in constant time. We construct perfect hash tables on the GPU using a hybrid of two randomized constructions. A thread is assigned to each item. First, it reads the randomly chosen top-level hash function and uses it to choose a bucket to hash to. The item then increments a counter for its bucket using an atomic add operation. We prefix sum the array of final counts, at which point we know a base and an offset for each item. We allocate memory, and then each item writes itself to the location defined by its base plus offset. Within a bucket, we organize the items using cuckoo hashing. The table is broken up into three subtables, each with its own hash function. Items that cannot fit into the first table proceed to the second one, and items that cannot fit into the second table proceed to the third. An item that fails to fit into the third table, like H, goes back to the first table and evicts the item currently in the location that it wants. The eviction process continues until all items have found a spot. Each bucket is processed within a block. We write out the cuckoo hash tables with all the first tables together, then all the second, and then all the third tables. This allows more coalesced access for parallel lookups. Hash tables are useful for representing voxelized surface data. Only the surface voxels are stored in the hash table, greatly reducing the storage requirements. This is called spatial hashing. Here, we are using spatial hashing to find the intersection of two moving surfaces. At every frame, we read a point cloud for each surface and construct a hash table for the voxels containing the points. We find the green intersections by looking up the voxels of one surface and the table of the other, we use the hash tables to flood fill along the surface to find the blue region inside the other object. Here, we compute a Boolean difference, subtracting one running man from the other. The user can move the men around interactively. We achieve a frame rate of about 27 frames per second using a virtual voxel grid of size 128 cubed with surfaces of roughly 160,000 points. Matching is another important application of hash tables. Here, we have two different images of a carved relief from Persepolis. We use a Sobel edge detector to select distinctive feature points in both images. We encode triples of points from one image in a way that is invariant to translation, rotation, and scaling, and store the codes into a hash table. Then, we look up triples from the other image in the table. When we find a match, we vote for a correspondence. In this case, the top ranked correspondence matches the two images almost perfectly. This technique is called geometric hashing. In this clip of two people fighting, we look for the fallen man on the upper left. The graph shows the number of votes for the best correspondence in each frame. The best match usually aligns the query shape to the man in black. But when he bends down, the algorithm cannot find enough matching triples. When there is a perfect match, we find it. Here, we recognize some of the monuments that Matt Harding dances in front of in his semi-famous YouTube videos. This image of St. Basil's Cathedral at the Kremlin matches Matt's video. It does not match this Bangkok street scene. Here, we match this image of the Taj Mahal to the video. We don't get a good match at Prague Castle, as expected. We match a video frame, including voting for all potential correspondences, in about two seconds on average. The construction of the hash table for about 3 million items takes 44 milliseconds. Thank you for your attention. All right, so I'm not promising that at the end of 124 you'll be able to do that necessarily, but I am promising that you'll get a lot of the skills that you will need to go forward 
into your further classes where you will be able to take algorithms and data structures and find cool things to do with them. I view CS124 as putting the real science in computer science, that it's going to give you the tools you need to do a lot of really interesting things all the way rest down the line. Why is it not clicking? There, okay. Um, all right, so the course goal for this is to provide everyone with a solid background in algorithms and data structures in preparation for future work, graduate level work in algorithms, further work in your undergraduate classes, or for jobs in industry. One of the things that uh, I'm always excited and relieved to hear afterwards is that when people go out on their job interviews, um, they always come back and tell me that they were asked questions that have exactly to do with something they learned in the CS 124. You know, this is the sort of skills people are looking for when they're looking for a job, not just that you know how to program, but that you know how to think about problems, that you know the ways to attack problems, that you know the sort of tricks and techniques that can be used to solve problems to get working code solutions. And so the key course goal is to actually get you ready, uh, whether this means you're going on in your studies or going on in the work world. Um, so the class setup, I welcome people from all different areas. You know, certainly uh, the bulk of people tend to be computer science and applied math concentrations, but we also get people every year from biology, physics, economics, mathematics, and other areas, because more and more, as other fields are doing more and more computing, the people in those fields are finding that they need to understand algorithms and how they work. Um, the assignments in the class, because I do believe in, you know, algorithm practice and not just algorithm theory, they tend to be a mix. There's certainly going to be plenty of theoretical and mathematical work, um, but we're also going to have programming assignments. My joke is I find that this maximizes uh, the feelings of unhappiness. The mathematicians are unhappy because they have to program, and the non-mathematicians are unhappy because they have to do math. But it really is the best way to get both ends to understand not just how algorithms, to think about them abstract, abstractly, but also how to implement them and how, what the tangible gains they can actually get you on real problems. So this class, CS50, is the minimum prerequisite, um, but I should point out certainly 51 and 61, 121, and strong math backgrounds are all helpful, um, but not at all required. Okay, the sort of topics we're going to cover, uh, a rough list, you know, we'll go over uh, graph algorithms, we'll go over a variety of techniques for solving problems, greedy algorithms, divide and conquer, dynamic programming, linear programming. We'll look at things like hashing, something which you just saw a video on, some advanced hashing techniques, uh, and randomness, how to use randomness in algorithms, how to understand how randomness can help you in algorithms. We'll look at NP-complete problems and how to solve them. If you've learned anything about NP-complete NP -complete problems, that may seem like an odd statement to, that you know, NP-complete problems are supposed to be the problems that we're not supposed to be able to solve. Um, but of course, in the real world, you can't just go to your boss and say, well, this problem's NP-complete, so I don't have to do it anymore. You know, they're going to expect a solution, so we'll come up with ways and techniques and thinking that will let you solve them for practical situations. Uh, currently scheduled, if I read the the book right, Tuesday, Thursday, 11.30 to 1. You know, I hope you'll consider it for this spring. If not, I'll hope you'll consider it for your next spring. Um, offered every year. And I hope to see you there. Thanks. All right, well, so next up Great. is going to be Professor Hans-Peter Pfister, who teaches Computer Science 171, which is visualization. Uh, this is actually a course like CS61 and CS179 that actually didn't exist in my time. And to be honest, it's sort of with envy that I see what kind of courses they've added to the undergraduate roster because, and this isn't just saying this because my former professors are here or because I think I need to say this, I mean, a lot of these, I think, are great fun. And the fact that you can take these courses after just 50 alone is really quite empowering. So, Professor Pfister. Thanks a lot, um, and thanks for coming. So I'm teaching visualization, so you might ask, well, what is visualization? Visualization is essential to convey information through visual representations. So we're talking about graphs, charts, maps, and all kinds of fancy ways to visually depict information. And in particular, this class will focus on interactive applications of visualization, where you can actually interact with any of these in an interactive way. So uh, if the previous courses were more about the science of computer science, 
This class is much more about the design and computer science. So it's a combination of both design and computer science. And as a matter of fact, only about a third of the students in this class are CS concentrators. So this is really a class that should appeal to pretty much everybody because I believe everybody is dealing with information. Now, why is this class important? Um, I think actually visualization is one of the big topics that we currently have to deal with. It's because we're living in the age of information explosion. So we have too much information online. We can't really make sense of it all in just text form. And so we need some other representations in order to understand it all. This is even more so in the sciences where people have coined the phrase the industrial revolution of data. So we're now able to collect data at a much faster rate than what we're able to process or comprehend. And that's because we have all these great sensors from the very small to the very large that provide us with more and more data. So in order to understand all of this, we need some means to, uh, to basically look at the data, and this is probably the worst possible way to do that. So instead of just looking at numbers, we want to look at visual representations. And as Donald Norman, one of the great um, industrial designers and, and HCI expert has said, it is things that make us smart. So we learned how to write down things so we can preserve history. We learned how to make pictures and graphs so that we can understand information and convey it. So this class, um, or I should say visualization in general, will help us think. I hope the class will help you think too. Um, it reduces the load on working memory. It offloads from our cognition because we can literally represent the information in a different medium. And it uses the power of human perception. So as you may know, our visual system is the uh, biggest sensory organ and it's represented in our brain in, with about half of the neurons in the brain. So we have a huge amount of perceptual power that we can actually use to understand information. So the goals of the class are to teach you the principles of how to make effective graphs, charts, maps, and visualizations. And then how to teach you to gather the data, in particular from online sources. So we're going to teach you how to use Python, which is a very nice uh, and simple to learn scripting language to scrape information from web pages. And then using that uh, information that you gathered, implement interactive visualizations using a Java framework called processing. And again, processing is relatively easy to learn. And finally, uh, we have a few programming homeworks and a final project where you can put all of those skills that you're learning in the class to use. So what I'd like to do next is show you a, a few projects that students have done last year. And I'm going to start with Jason Gao. So Jason, actually, in all of this, um, the students start with a question that is of personal interest. And I'm sorry I can't fit it all on the screen right now, but he started with the question, what is the energy use of the different buildings on the Harvard campus? And it turns out that that information is actually available from the um, Harvard Office of, um, what is it called? I guess of public buildings. Um, so what he did is he plotted the yearly energy use of the different buildings on the map using circles representing the size of the energy use. And as you may be able to see here on the right, he also has a pie chart that shows you how the different buildings use that energy depending on the type of energy. So let me move this over. So green is electricity, red is steam, blue is chilled water. And you can see that depending on the building shown up here with their name, uh, you have very different energy, energy usage patterns. And as a matter of fact, um, if I were able to scroll, you could actually see that this energy usage patterns changes over the year. So down here, he has a visualization of how this changes over the course of the year, and uh, the pie chart up there will automatically update. Now going back here, let me just show you the last bit of the visualization, which is you also have a list view that show you the biggest and smallest energy consumers on the Harvard campus over here. And again, um, you know, depending on the time of year, you have different buildings that use different amounts of energy. So this was an effective visualization to show you the energy usage on the Harvard campus. Next project I'd like to show is by Naveen Sinha. 
Um, Naveen was interested in finding good restaurants in the Cambridge and Boston area. And instead of just building yet another visualization of sort of ratings, he actually went to the different newspapers here in town, Boston Magazine, Boston Globe, Boston Herald, and Boston Phoenix, and he computed an average or compound score for each of the restaurants that those newspapers rate. And then what he's showing here is the deviation from this average score between the different newspapers. So uh, let's quickly look at that. So here again is this visualization. Let's first turn off the filter here. Um, you can actually see the name of the restaurant here. So number one is Oya, followed by Les Balliers, followed by number nine, followed by Uni, and so on. So for those of you who like to eat well, uh, you probably recognize some of these names. So the restaurants are ordered from right to left, the top ranked restaurant on the average rating being on the rightmost side. But then he's showing the deviation. Um, bars that go above the line show that this particular newspaper, for example, Boston Magazine, has ranked this restaurant here, Aura, on average higher than the compound average score of all of the, rest, all of, all of the ratings. And similarly, some of them were ranked lower. So you might see, for example, the Boston Herald seems to be more critical of some of the restaurants that are typically ranked highly, and then some others are a little um, ranked a little better over here. Then you can look at you know, the different categories. So here are the inexpensive restaurants, and you might find out that Garden at the Cellar is a very good uh, value if you like good food and don't want to spend so much money. You can conversely look at the expensive restaurants. Not surprisingly, uh, most of them are here in the top category. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't really see some of the bars on this projector, but um, I'll just show you these are all top ranked and expensive. But then this one here, Mu, is actually expensive but doesn't get such a good compound ranking. So it might not be such a great value for your money. You may want to find out which cuisine is um, high, uh, ranked highest. And it turns out Japanese actually is Oya and Uni and uh, the Oishi Sushi Bar. Uh, they're all ranked very highly, and so on. Let me show you another example from last year. Karen Hansen, uh, she works in the uh, micro um, cellular and biology laboratory, and she's uh, going to apply to grad school, and she wanted to find out how are the different MCB labs around the country um, deal with admissions. So she put together this nice visualization. Again, I probably cannot move this, I'm sorry, but she put together a nice visualization of admissions based on different schools and uh, based around the country, showing you what are you know, the areas where admissions are relatively high, so definitely California is one of them, Massachusetts being another, and then showing you the sort of statistics of the typical student that get in, gets into these programs. And then over here, she also has more information about each school, how many students they admit per year, and what kind of uh, characteristics that each school is looking for. And then also the top faculty in the country that admit students in MCB, and uh, what kind of profile that they're typically looking for. So lastly, related to this, there was a project by Xiao He, who also was interested in MCB, but he looked at the publication records of faculty at MCB here at Harvard. What he did is a visualization showing you the different uh, publications that the faculty have. So you have the list of faculty here on the right, and then the size of the circle shows you how many papers a year they published. You can't see the legend, but I happen to know the big circle is 30 papers a year. So this professor here had 30 publications a year. The x-axis is numbers of years since PhD. So this is a senior person, and here is actually a more junior person. And the y-axis is if they were a senior author or a junior author, or i.e. a first author on the paper. So you can see some of the more junior faculty tend to put themselves as, as first authors, whereas most of the senior faculty tend to be senior authors. Again, uh, he was interested in this particular question. He also did a timeline of publications over time for each of the faculty. So you can see that 
the senior faculty tend to peter out after a certain number of years uh, of being in the business. So I think these were some really fun examples from last year. Um, I invite you to go to the website and you'll see a lot more. And I also want to briefly mention the topics we'll cover. We'll talk about uh, perception, sort of the fundamentals of interaction design and visual design. And then we'll talk about different uh, visualization um, types, such as graphs, maps, trees and networks. We talk about how to visualize high dimensional data. And finally, we have some guest lectures of people coming in talking about application areas, such as scientific visualization, or life science visualization, or even visualization and the arts. So I hope to see you all uh, during shopping period, and uh, thanks a lot. So we have just one more teaser for you. This one from Professor uh, Christoph Gaios, who's teaching Computer Science 179, which is ostensibly about user interfaces. Hi, my name is Christoph Gaios. Uh, how many of you here are first years at Harvard? Well, so am I. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I think what makes Harvard Computer Science incredibly exciting is not only the computer scientists, but everybody else at Harvard. It's the fact that Harvard focuses not only on the bits, but also on the rest of the world. We are here to make an impact. Um, uh, Greg, Matt, and Michael told you a lot about how you can solve problems and the skills that you need for solving problems. And I think this is ex actually an extremely important for, for computer science. In fact, let me start uh, with a story from my own undergraduate experience. My first research opportunity uh, down at the technical college, you know, a little bit down the river, uh, was with an information retrieval group. David Carger was incredibly interested in web search. It was the time of Alta Vista, web crawler, meta crawler. And each week he would start the, the meeting by bringing up one of those new uh, search engines, because they tended to pop up roughly once a week, uh, he would test it always in the same way. He would type in his name and see what came up. And inevitably, the first thing that would came up in those engines would be a, uh, a, a publications database that, you know, listed his name more than once, or another website that mentioned him, but it was never his homepage. And one day, I knew that things have changed. He looked different. There was suspense in the classroom. He was going to tell us something very special. He brought up a search engine, a brand new search engine, typed in his name, and out came his name. What was that search engine? No, it was not Alta Vista. It was Google. What was special about Google? What made Google special? It was the fact that there was a very important problem, search problem that has existed, that has been around for many years. There were lots of people working on it. And Google guys figured out how to solve that problem well. They used all of the skills in computer science and came up with the great solution. They started with a well-defined problem, and they came up with a great solution, and that made them great. But I argue that besides being incredibly smart, Larry and Sergey were also incredibly lucky. How many great problems, well-specified problems, can you name off the top of your head? Probably not that many, right? I think, as computer scientists, we need another skill. And this is the skill that all of these people have. These people have the skill of going out in the world and finding the problem. They go, talk to people, figure out that people have a problem that they themselves might not even know about, and then they come up with such a compelling solution that they change how the world operates. And this, actually, is the premise of CS179. CS179, called the design of use, usable in, uh, interactive systems, will be offered for the first time kind of on a permanent basis this spring. It was offered once before by a visiting faculty. And this class is not about solving problems. It's not about understanding problems. It's about discovering problems. So the fundamental question of this class is what is computer science and what it's not. Unfortunately, many people, not you because you wouldn't be here, think of computer science as something like this. But this is not what computer science is. Computer science is an extremely powerful intellectual toolkit for discovering and solving problems. 
And your success as a computer scientist depends not only on how well you can solve the problems, but on what problems you solve. And in CS179, we'll precisely focus on this entire life cycle of innovation. In CS179, you will learn how to discover that there exists a problem, a powerful problem, a problem that if you solved it could change people's lives. You will learn how to invent solutions. And when we, when we invent solutions to problems that we've just discovered, it's not just about you know, writing code to specification. It's figuring out what aspects of that problem are actually important. It's figuring out who the stakeholders are and whose needs you should address first. It's about figuring out what you need to do in order for your solution to actually be sustainable and adopted. An, ext an extremely important skill that you will learn in CS179 is that you are not an average person, which is actually a terrible handicap because it means that you have no idea what normal people think. When we design solutions, we design for different people. We design for people who love control. We, delight, we design solutions for people who like to tweak. But this is not what other people like to do. And we'll actually learn about our own biases and what makes and how we can overcome them. We'll also learn how to formally and informally evaluate uh, our ideas. Um, and actually, a big part of the, of the class is going to be a critique sessions. Once a week, we are going to meet in small groups, present uh, our contributions for that week, and other students in, in that small group will actually present formative critiques of whatever progress you and your group made to help you improve your system. One of the greatest assets that we have as innovators is other innovators, other people who understand the innovation process and who can offer useful uh, feedback that can help shape your, your solutions. And finally, this class will be about teamwork. All of the projects will be done in teams of three, uh, and the projects will last most of the semester with uh, a couple of short breaks. Uh, so on the practical side, the main prerequisite for this class is CS50 or any kind of programming experience. We will be using uh, uh, the, uh, the specific programming skills that you will need for, to be successful in this class. We'll actually cover in the class. All you need to know is how to think like a programmer. Lectures will be twice a week. We'll have critique sessions and we'll have regular uh, weekly assignments. There may be final exam. I haven't decided yet. An exciting thing is Apple has uh, offered to lend us uh, iPod Touches. Every team of three will have their own iPod Touch, and iPod Touch web development will be the platform uh, that we'll use for innovating in this class. Any questions? Okay, uh, I'll see you in the spring of 2010. So I thought I'd leave you guys with one thought. So truth be told, I think there's something very empowering about studying computer science. And I say this having defected from Gov long ago. I mean, I can think of innumerable experiences just in the real world where this background I had, not just in 50, but in networking courses and in theory courses, where I actually realized very quickly, I understand better what this person I'm talking to is actually talking about. So case in point, Comcast is my, was for years my cable modem provider. And every night around like 9 p.m. I would just lose internet connectivity altogether. And this happened again and again and again. And I talked to so many damn representatives on the phone about this pattern. And of course the irony there being such a big company, well, sir, we can send someone out between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. every day. But, I'm like, but it only happens after 5 p.m. And so I hypothesized for them on the phone, you know, maybe this has to do with some real-world usage patterns, right? A lot of my neighbors come home around 7 p.m., 8 p.m. Perhaps this is putting more of a load on your equipment. No, 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 it looks fine right now, sir, at, you know, 9 a.m. in the morning. And long story short, you know, this, this sort of instinctive understanding of how routers work and how local hardware and electronics work helped me realize, you know, maybe there was something a little more to it then. Cisco, for instance, makes, is a very popular company that makes really expensive and really high-powered 
uh, routers and switches. And in my consulting life, um, some months ago, we had just deployed this real world Cisco switch, uh, Swiss, uh, Cisco firewall, actually. And I'd never used these things before. A lot of the stuff was kind of over my head. The documentation's like this thick. But I knew from CS143 networking, you know, how a router is supposed to work, how a firewall is supposed to work. And there, too, this firewall, brand new, out of the box, installed by very expensive consultants, was crashing on us again and again every day. And frankly, I whipped out my CS50 skills. Uh, SSH'd into this thing because it's really just a Unix computer that's running and found all of these core files, which I didn't really understand, but I knew from my time 10 years ago weren't necessarily a good thing. And sure enough, the firmware, the software running on this Cisco very expensive switch was just buggy. Cisco had screwed up and the thing was seg faulting once a night around a particular time. But it was these instincts of being able to solve these problems myself and being able to identify problems, as Christoph has mentioned there, in the real world. It's like, wow, wouldn't it be great if we had this Twitter aggregator? Why? Eh, not because it's terribly useful, but because we can. And that's the sense of empowerment that I got from all of these computer science courses I got. And whether you're considering majoring or minoring or just dabbling in computer science, hopefully you gathered from the faculty who joined us today that there's many different directions in which you guys can go after this. Uh, so I hope you will join us next semester uh, on Wednesday for quiz one and also on Monday for our final class. See you on Wednesday.